models to boxes. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of actually attending some sessions today. Never do that if you're speaking. Because then you can come up here under the impression that you're going to say stuff that people have not heard. <laughs> I made that mistake. So a lot of what, you know, I, I've noticed this. Every year at an event like Cypher, somehow a theme seems to emerge. I, I don't think it's willful. I don't think it's on purpose. But last year seemed to be a lot about hyper-personalization. So everybody's talking about hyper-personalization. This year, the next person who comes up here to talk about scaling AI is in trouble, right? Because we've just had so many talks about it. My talk was supposed to be about something similar, but I kind of made some notes and I've changed it quite a bit right now. Quick introductions. My name is Sandeep Mittal. I head up Cartesian Consulting. We're a data analytics firm, do a lot of work out here in the US and APAC and stuff. Uh, I also like to doodle and cartoon a lot. So, and I did this last year as well. So I think there's one slide I have where I've actually typed out stuff, but otherwise it's all kind of handmade. So that's, that's slowly turning out to be one of the things which I like doing. It's all handmade slides. And then the fourth, you know, this gets really hard. Fourth year of coming at Cypher, you're like, what the hell are you going to talk about? You know, I, I spoke about the business of analytics in 2016. Then there was storytelling with data in 2017. There was a segment of one last year, and this year was really proving to be a challenge. What does one talk about? Till I thought, okay, let's go with the real life experience of the change that we've seen in Cartesian over the last year, which is like, you know, like, like the topic says, going from models to boxes. We covered a bit of this in MachineCon. Me and Ramsu, Ramsu was there on the panel kind of uh, earlier today. He's on a panel tomorrow as well. And this entire topic was about, you know, a lot of our lives for the longest time have been kind of defined by the models that we built. It's not a bad thing, but you know, what we called out in machine con were things like, we build models on sparse data a lot of the time. Not a great thing, you know? And then um, what happens sometimes we fall in love with our models and we don't take alternate points of view. And then sometimes what happens is, you know, the models need to actually function within a larger ecosystem, and we don't account for that. But models have really been the defining factor of our lives for the longest time, but that's changing now. What's happening is this. There are business problems that are larger than the models. We deal a lot with CRM in segment of one. Now, you know, when you're dealing with a problem where the business says, drive more frequency of purchase through relevance, I think it's a fairly obvious thing that a model can't solve for that. There's too many moving parts. So about a year ago, year and a half ago, when we started working with that problem, we started thinking that the right way to do that is to chain a series of models together. And you know what? We were in trouble because uh, there's a very different thinking and a way of applying yourself that needs to go into complex business problems, which is what I wanted to talk about. This is what we've done. We created this product called Solus. We launched it in MachineCon in June, so check it out. But a lot of my story today is going to be about the journey we've had in moving from being analytics, services, consulting, to someone who's also developed a product. Trust me, we did not get it right a lot of the time because the mindset you need is very different. The segment of one problem has a number of sub-problems, which is, What's the recommendation of, I mean, what segment of one, honestly? It's like, you got a million customers, you need a system that will wake up and treat each one of them individually every single day. So that's what you, that's what a segment of one system will do. And there's so many little things that need to go into it. You know, you try to solve a lot for what product should I recommend. But then what's your next best action? At what time? With what medium? What's the governance? Should I talk? Should I not talk? What words should I use in the communication? There's just so much that's happening. Can models do it? They can't. Hence boxes. So the, it, this is not definition area. This is the way we are looking at it. It needs to be autonomous, and the word autonomous has been used a lot today. Yes, it needs to be autonomous. It is going to be data-driven, otherwise it would not be an analytical system. It needs to help with decision-making at scale. So for example, we also do a lot of uh, you know media mix modeling kind of work. That's not decision-making at scale. It's a high-stakes, highly infrequent decision for most of the brands you work with. 
would you build a box for that? Of course you won't build a box. So that's, that's kind of stupid. You won't do that for that kind of a decision. If it is some, you know, if it is something like, should one recommend this blue shirt to Sandeep today? Now you're going to do that for a million customers. You're not going to kind of sit and look at the data of Sandeep and figure it out individually. That doesn't work either. So yes, it lends itself to a box making that decision. These are millions of tiny, low-stake decisions. And why I say low-stake is, if you recommended a white shirt instead of a blue shirt, big deal. Nobody's going to you know, shoot you for that. So it works. So boxes come in when you're doing that kind of decision making. Low stakes, millions of decisions. Humans can't take it. It's really at scale. You need to bring in boxes. This is probably the point that we grapple with most of the time. You build a system which is going to recommend stuff, timing, media, you know, words to use, etc. How do you even verify it is effective? How do you verify it? You know, the, the problem we really, really grappled with is we've always had test and control. That's been the way we've verified that something works. You know, and verifying something ineffective in a physical world, like if you go to the coffee machine, you press the button, you get a cappuccino, it's worked, right? In our world, what's happening is you press a button, a virtual button, and you get a list of customers with a recommended product next to those customers. I'm, I'm sticking with recommendation part of that picture because it's just easier. But you get a list with a recommendation. Now, if you read a lot of Terry Pratchett, you may even imagine that there's a tiny imp in a little box which is writing out that list of recommendations. And it is no smarter than complete noise unless you're able to actually verify that it works. When it's a single model, you set up test and control, you verify. You now have a box which has recommendation and timing and governance and image selection and word selection. How do you verify that the box as a whole work as well as all these tiny components within it? Box as a whole, test control, no problem, sorted. Is the recommendation system within the box working? How do you solve for that? Do you once in a while throw random recommendations which are not generated by that little component and see if those work equally well. And if they do work equally well, what have you got? That that little component within your box doesn't work. So to be able to verify that the box and its internal components are effective is a big challenge. Why does one need to do it? Sometimes you're doing it just to you know, get trust in the people who are going to use it. There is that marketing guy over there who will say, this box is great, this timing module of yours, does it work? How do you prove to me that it works well enough? That's a really, really hard challenge to solve for. Because if you now think of the testing mechanism you have to build to solve for this, it is just insane. You've got 10 components. Are you going to do test and control and keep turning one on and off and figure out how to... And uh, Ramsu told me this yesterday, that you know, if we have a simple way of solving for this, it's almost guaranteed that that's the wrong way of doing it. <laughs> because there's just no simple way of testing a complex box which has got a number of components within it. All right. This, again, I'm sure between yesterday and today, has been touched upon a lot, interpretability and explainability. When we're building a box like Solus, this is what we thought. You know, let me again stick with recommendation systems. When you tell a person on the business side of it that I'm using collaborative filtering to make product recommendations, you know what today? They get it. Everybody's heard these words often enough and like just so much out there in the media at conference that everybody gets it. So in a way, you've explained what that component does. That's your explainability. You honestly don't need to go any further than that when you're talking about this component as a whole. When you're working on the same thing, and they want to understand why did Sandeep get the blue shirt recommendation, then you need explainability at n equal to 1, more complex. When we're building the box, we had to account for how do we make this easy for people? Should we even make it easy for people, damn it? Because you, are in, you, know, you create a lot of work for yourself to solve for this when it's an automatic system. <laughs> you create a lot of work for yourself. You, 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 will, you know, when I talked about the shift, 
when you're building models, you've got these people, you've got this human interaction, you can sit with them, you can talk to them, you can tell them why things are working a certain way. You turn a box on, it's like what Piyush was saying in the panel discussion. The box has a, you know, it has a much higher responsibility to be right than people. You suddenly need an interface to explain things, you're creating a lot of work for yourself. So we really need to think through, when you're creating a box, how do you deal with making it explainable enough without over-engineering it? Because they need to be autonomous, right? Otherwise, it won't be a box. If it's going to be autonomous, if it's going to run on its own, care and feeding has to happen on its own. What are care and feeding? When the, we were building models, it was fairly straightforward. You recalibrate your model, you check on the model parameters, etc. No problems. It is now a box. It now has 10 components within it. They're all running. It has to be able to do self-healing, but we've discovered that, you know, it doesn't always work out for us. It's not as simple as saying, okay, now let's build self-healing models, end of story. Life is, I wish, you know, it were that simple. It's never that simple. Because very often, actively, when you're diagnosing and recalibrating models, you actually do a better job than self-healing models. So it's, again, a call to be taken. How autonomous is good? It's not as simple as saying, you know, let's create a box, make it, make it fully autonomous, life is over. Because autonomous comes at a cost. And that cost sometimes is quality and accuracy. It also comes with limitations. You know, these are social systems we're dealing with. We are making recommendations to be relevant to people and we want them to buy. Now the store next door shuts down. Suddenly sales go up. Can the box explain it? No, the box can't explain it. I mean, the, you know, the point really is, if you create a box, you, you're taking on the responsibility of the box, putting up its hand and saying, I can't do this job right anymore. <laughs> when you're building models, the modeler would understand that and correct it. When you're building boxes, the box has to be able to own up, saying that, you know, this problem has fought back. The data has changed. My entitlement isn't what it used to be. It has to be able to own up. And that's another thing you have to start building into your box. So if you're building a governance system, and the governance system said that, you know, three times communication is OK for this person in the next two weeks, and then something happened where it's no longer working, it has to be able to own up. This is an interesting one. I, you know, I, 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 I drew this one, and I thought people would get it. And then when I asked five people, nobody got it. This is like from Minority Report. That's supposed to be Tom Cruise. But it doesn't look at all like Tom Cruise, but anyway. Basically, the point was, like in the minority report, sometimes when you observe th something, you change what you're observing. You build a model. You start acting on your customers because of the model you've built. You've actually changed your system itself. <laughs> because the ones that you communicate with, be more relevant to, they start behaving differently. So your model itself, your box itself, has to account for the fact that there's a box in the system right now. <laughs> which is slightly paradoxical, but that's life. It's like lifetime value. Lifetime value is something we are always extremely wary of. People say, calculate CLTV, no problem, we'll calculate CLTV. Then they say, let's act, act on that. Those with the high potential to be high value in the future, let's kind of be more relevant to them, communicate with them, give them offers. The thing is, by acting on it, it's an active system now, by acting on it, you change their CLTV. So you computed something, but it's changed because you acted on it. So it's, it's a bit of a loop. There is a feedback loop happening over there. I mentioned this very early on, but our world in particular is full of sparse data. Everybody says we've got these millions of customers, but they know extremely little about these millions of customers. If you work in retail, for example, 60 to 70% of your database has come once. So it is wide, but it is extremely sparse. So we don't have rich data. If you want to s create intelligent systems based on that, based on, on the basis of that sparsity of data, very often you start with being rules-based because you just don't have enough training data. You start with being rules. I mean, it's a practical thing to do. And you know, we get these, this a lot nowadays. If you've got a system, people first question people ask is, is it rules or learning-based? It's kind of a question that's like front and center. 
you may end up being rules-based to begin with. No problems. Rules are not bad. Rules are the distillation of the intuition and the insight that business people have. You're not going to chuck that out of the window. You start with being rules-based. But then you need to create a new thing in your box, which is a systematic way to challenge those rules. And that's where things like your MABs will come into the picture, where you're constantly challenging the rules on a set of people so that you can start learning. But this did not exist so much in the earlier era where we built models, much so when we were building autonomous boxes. Challenge the rules systematically so that you can learn. Oh, sorry. There we go. Straightforward, crucial one. We build this entire, if you build a system, like we, we are building a segment of one system, it has to play nice with upstream and downstream systems. For example, you know, you do all the work of figuring out that recommended product and the timing and the messaging, all of that. And at the end of it, if the marketing team comes back to say, we don't have product images. <laughs> we can't do any of this personalization you wanted to do. End of it. You, may, you, know, you have to create a system that understands what's ha going to happen next. Can the messaging system handle it? Can you send out really intelligent coupons to the person, but can the front-end boss handle it? Can you, sh you know, can you verify those coupons at the front-end? So you have to be able to create systems that play nice with the systems that go upstream and downstream. We didn't worry so much about them when you're creating models. You have to worry a lot more about them when you create boxes. And more importantly, it has to play nice with people because people are far trickier than systems, and we all know that. With people, here's what happens. You create the system, you turn it on. Relevant recommendations going out to customers, no problem. The people will suddenly step up and say, I don't want this recommendation going out today. I've got this talk of denims stuck. I want to liquidate that. Forget about your relevant recommendations, push denims. Now, you can't, you can't battle this, and you should not battle this. You need to create a system that will not try to battle this. You, I mean, you can kick and scream all you want and say, let's be relevant, but the fact is, business is business. They've got to liquidate product. They're going to have to do it. So a system should be able to allow for a tactical adjustment. And it has to be stable enough that this adjustment is allowed. It has to be plastic enough that if it's a radical change, it can change. So we've had to start to think, and think about how do we bake in things like stability into the boxes that we have. Sorry, one more thing about people. People are by nature suspicious, so they actually tend to require a lot of interface creation just so that they can understand what is happening. Explainability sometimes is just in the form of, this is what happened, this step is over, this is the process that you just have to build in a lot of interface so that people are comfortable that things are working, and you need to give them overrides. Like I said, override the recommended system with denims going out to every single bit. We've, the, I think yesterday and today, a lot has been touched about it. I heard the entire example of the Amazon hiring thing and all of that, you know, using models in attrition modeling, which kind of changed the way you hire people. I mean, there are a whole bunch of ethical questions that are going to come up. And, you know, I think the way to really deal with it is blind spots are blind spots because you haven't even seen them. So in a way, you do the best you can when you build boxes and you avoid biases and all of that if you can, if it allows you to. But otherwise, the real way to deal with it is, again, a constant testing mechanism, something that will challenge your current way of doing stuff all the time. So that Always on challenging is probably one good way of building a box that will not kind of be inbred. Now, you know, for the longest time, we were pure analytics kind of consulting firm. When we started building boxes, we found that the skill sets are hugely different. And we've heard a lot about that as well today. It's suddenly engineering. It's suddenly product management. The, end, the, the way you organize yourself, the kind of rigor you need, is fundamentally very different. When you build a box and you go to a client, who owns the IP of that? Is also another big question. Because you suddenly built a box, it's not a bespoke model. So, and, you know, 
data scientists in particular may have a lot of rigor when it comes to the analytics side of it, but the rigor in sticking to timelines and delivering a, on a product roadmap is very different. Now my sympathies are with the data scientists. They very often don't know what they're dealing with in terms of cleansing you know, the, the data itself, so they can't commit to a timeline. But you know, you can't wake up at the 11th hour and say, chalo, let's put a night out and let's build this box. It, model, yes, possible, did it. Box building, huge, large scale, autonomous systems, it's not a movie. You can't have a superhero flying in on, you know, at the 11th hour and fixing things. It's really extremely rigorous project management. And the skill sets you need to be able to do that are fundamentally different. And I think we should all admit that they don't necessarily exist in the data sciences world. You need to get them from the product development software engineering world, is at least what's worked for us. <laughs> Last thing. This is no different from anything we've ever had to deal with in all our lives as people who worked in the analytics field. You do everything you want, people don't adopt it. Now, where does the onus of this lie? I would argue the onus of adoption lies with us. No, you know, my own guys here, yeah, they say, you know, why does the client not adopt it? They make it sound like the clients are daft. I think if adoption is weak, there's something wrong that we've done. We've not made it easy to adopt. We haven't sold the story well enough most of the time. You've got to get people excited about what you're doing. You've got to bring them in. You've got to make them champions for you even before you've shown them the product. There's a lot of skill over there. So if you want to embed a box which has got analytics baked in into an organization, it's a much larger job than just building a mo model and kind of letting it out there in the wild. So that's kind of what I had. I think verifiably effective. How do you test that your box that you're building is verifiably effective is a big thing to think through. And it's not easy if you have multiple components chained one after the other in a box like your like our segment of one system. Whoops. Sorry, I pressed something. It needs to be autonomous. It needs to be explainable, not just at the aggregate, but also at the individual level. If required, comes with its problems of you know, you're adding complexity, which you may not need to. There is very often a feedback loop, which is because you've created a box and you're analyzing something and acting on it, you're actually changing the outcome. You've got to keep challenging the rules. You've got to play nice with systems and with people. Design for ethics and organize yourselves well to be able to embed it into organizations. That's what I had. Thank you. <laughs> hmm. I have, I think, two and a half minutes for questions. If any, something there. Hi, Sandeep. Uh, this Hi. is Vinay from uh, Ugam. Uh, could resonate a lot of uh, what you said, being around marketing analytics, uh, mm. daily pains. Uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you was, after building the box, uh, the relationship with the client, uh, that can be tenuous. Uh, and I'll state an example to um, talk about it. Um, so there, there was a vendor who used to give recommendations on coupons and they used to use it as a black box mm. uh, or a box, let me just call it that. Uh, but then they got, that company got bought over and uh, by let's say IBM and mm. they suddenly started charging three times what they were charging mm. and the client said, I can't buy that. So now they were without a recommendation system, right? Mm. And uh, suddenly they started losing revenue. So how is that relationship with the client to the point you made about IP? Is it theirs, is it ours? Uh, how's that relationship? This is really going to have to be a case-by-case -case decision by organizations. You know why P organizations will take the call to not build boxes but license them and not own the IP? Because it's a huge effort. If you can do a model build in a few weeks, a box build can take you like 18 months. So it is really a very commercial economics decision of the cost and investment of building a box is so large that having full control and ownership of it may just not be worthwhile. You may as well just license it and live with some of the risk that yes, that startup who built that box for you may get swallowed up by the big blue and it will vanish. It's, it's, it's really about the effort is at a different scale. So it's not easy to s kind of flip the switch and say, okay, let's build it. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.